Good afternoon, and thanks for joining us today. My name is Corey Webb, and I'm the Marketing Director here at Churn Zero, and I'd like to welcome you to our webinar titled From Overwhelmed to Over Quota, How to Be a More Effective CSM. Before we get started, I'd like to remind you that we are recording this session, and we'll be sending out a link 24 hours after this webinar. Throughout the presentation, you're welcome to submit your questions via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and we will address as many as we can at the end of this webinar. Um, now I'm in Please introduce to you our presenter today. We have Ryan Johansson. Ryan runs a stress management and productivity training program and has a background in customer success leadership, which makes him the perfect person for us to be talking to today um, about how to become a more proactive CSM with less stress. Um, Ryan led one of our most popular webinars last year on stress management, so we're excited to have him back this year and today to share some sage advice, and clearly this is a topic that resonates with folks because um, we have over 1,700 people registered for this session today, so I'm really excited um, about this one, and um, with that, I'll turn it over to you, Ryan, to get started. Awesome. Thank you so much, Corey. And thank you to Turn Zero. It's super excited to be here today. And uh, thanks to everyone that showed up today. Um, really glad to have you here. And give yourself a round of applause for even showing up. You've done the hardest part of just getting open the door so you can sit back, relax, and be covering some good stuff today. So like I said, my name is Ryan Johansson. I'm based in the Boston area, have been a CSM, and very excited to show you some stuff today. So. I know it might have been a little while since you registered, so I want to talk about what you'll get by hanging out today. So first thing you're going to learn is how to prioritize your day and become a top performer without burning out. Pretty tall order and a big promise, but very excited to share some strategies you can do to make that happen. And next, I want to cover how to proactively manage your book of business with a personal operating system. This sounds very extreme and complex, but it's actually a pretty simple way to run your day. And number three is how to manage your distractions that kill your productivity and make you miserable. This is something that I will always stand on my soapbox and talk about for anyone who will listen. So very glad to have you all here today. So let's dive into the problem. Um, chances are you might be dealing and feeling like this picture over here. So tell me if this sounds familiar. You pop open your email, you start the day like you've been shot out of a cannon. You're dealing with support tickets. Sales is asking you for a reference. Marketing is asking for a case study. Product wants to interview customers and you have to, a long list of emails to get back to. And then someone might have the gall to tell you, how come we're not getting anything done? Or how come you're behind? Um, so if you feel like that's your life, you're not alone. I certainly felt with, like that before. And I wanna cover today exactly how to handle things like that. So things that you might be dealing with as a reactive CSM is juggling a lot of priorities. You feel like there's never enough time in the day and you're living every single day stressed out. Um, and a lot of us are trying to grow our careers. And I think that's a great thing. That was certainly where I felt when I was in that situation. And what I would always go back to is doing more. I thought that was the answer. The more input I have, the more output there will be. But today, I actually want to share how that isn't the best way to go about it. And I learned that lesson in a very difficult way. But it's not always about doing more. It's about doing the right things. And that's what we're going to cover today. So naturally, you probably join this because there's something you want to get out of. And I've boiled it down to these four outcomes. So I'd love to hear in this poll, which would be the most beneficial for you? So are you looking to just get more control of your day? Are you gunning for a new promotion? And this is a way where you can get going. You're trying to make more money. Um, you know, if you hit your goals, you look better. Your chances are you're going to get a raise. Or do you just want to have a life outside of work? Is work completely taken over? Okay. so. The Always votes are matched, coming in yeah. pretty quickly. Um, <laughs> okay, I think I'm ready to project the winner as more control of your day, which is great. And that's really the crux of what we're going to cover today. But the good news is I'm going to share with you is all four of these are possible as you go from reactive to proactive. So let's talk about how you can do that. And I'm going to kill this poll. So... I want to start by sharing who I am and what my story is. So you might be wondering, who the heck is this guy? Um, I'm, a, I'm a pretty regular person. Uh, I you know, haven't won any awards. I'm not a, a top influencer or anything like that. Um, I've been a, an IC in customer success. I've been a manager of CS and a director of CS. And I've worked at uh, both large enterprises and more um, small startup companies. 
And I pride myself as someone who has been in the same situation as you. I am a former reactive CSM. Um, I have famously said on my last webinar that the first time I became a manager of customer success, I started working 12, 14 hour days. And it led me to the point where I was so stressed out and so overwhelmed that I checked myself into a hospital. And that was one of the worst experiences of my life. But what it fortunately did was it made me take a hard look at the way I was doing things and the way I was viewing work. And what, led, what that led to is me taking a hard look and reevaluating the way that I worked. I figured, you know, I still want to add value. I still want to do a lot, but I'm probably not doing things the right way. So I looked into it and I discovered, you know, I wanted to find out how can I get more done in less time? I want to succeed in work. I want to have a personal life and I want to grow my career. And I'm someone that uh, let's, let's say I'm greedy. I want to have it all. And I will lastly say that I'm not completely perfect. I'm still learning, I'm testing, I'm trying, but I'm confident that the things I'm gonna share with you today are gonna to make a difference for you. So the first step to becoming a proactive CSM, in my mind, is to prioritize your day and how effectively you can do that. And there's a great quote from an even better book called, if you don't prioritize your day, someone else will. And this is from the book, Essentialism by Greg McCown. If you're feeling super burnt out lately, um, and this is going to be a practical manual that you can check out. And then not to um, mention another book within another 10 seconds, but when I was really struggling, I picked up a book called The Four Disciplines of Execution. And this is written by some prominent authors who talk about how companies and people can achieve their goals. And they did a lot of case studies of organizations, and they broke it down to four disciplines. But one of the important things that was a takeaway for this book is the reason that big goals don't get done is because of this inner struggle between the urgent and the important. And the urgent they described as the whirlwind. That's our day job. That's when we're dealing with tickets, having QBRs, running customer calls, handling anything that comes in, managing emails, responding to Slack, all that stuff that left unchecked, you could spend 150 hours a week and still probably never get done with it. On the other hand, you have the important work. These are things which tend to add a lot of value to your company. Maybe you're coming up with a new deck for a customer or you're coming up with a new program that's gonna add a lot of value to your existing customer base. And I think it's important as a first step to learn how to make time for both. And the way you do that is by getting good at using your calendar. And I'm a big fan of saying, if you use your calendar or it will use you, I think this is a very simple first step you can take that's gonna make a massive impact on how your day is run and how overwhelmed you are, how control of your day is. This is really step one. So if you go into your day without a plan, you're gonna be overwhelmed and it's truly a recipe for disaster. Um, not only are you gonna be not as efficient, you get a lot more stressed out, you don't have that sense of control and you feel like you're just reacting to the world, which not only isn't good for a work perspective, it's also not very good for your mental health. So the recommendation here that was also made in the book is to spend 80% on your whirlwind activities. So that's running your day, doing what you got to do, and 20% on a more strategic initiatives. This is things that are going to move your career forward or help your customers or help your company. And the way to do this at a very practical level, and this is not even 20% of your time yet, is a 60-minute focus block of work in the morning. Maybe it can be the afternoon, whenever it works better for you. But the idea here is you want to schedule this time out, be very diligent about it, and make sure that you're getting the right things done in that time frame. And this is a starting point, and I'm going to expand from here. And we're going to, at the end of this webinar, have a fully built out plan for you. The next tip, which is as obvious as it might seem and very simple, is staying organized. I was previously very disorganized. And it's all about finding a system that works for you. But one of my biggest challenges was I would not write things down and try and keep everything in my head. And as I was reading about it, it's actually a very terrible way to keep a record. You're going to end up forgetting things. And subconsciously, just having a to-do list in your head actually makes a burden on you. So you feel like you have more work to do. It takes objectivity away. And that's a reason why you might feel like you can't do it all but you don't even know how much you have to do. So another tip here is one way that you lose a lot of time during the day 
is jumping from SCSMs when we have multiple systems we deal with or multiple links. So you're wondering where you put something, you're bouncing from system to system, checking on your browser, looking through your history. You can burn so much time trying to find information and get distracted in the process. So in that way, I advocate if you keep everything in one place and takes as many, as few clicks as possible, you'll have more time to keep doing things efficiently. So what that looks like, obviously with this webinar being on the shorter end, I can't give you exactly how I would go about this, but the idea is even using something like browser shortcuts where you can click quickly access the right information or using Turn Zero or a system like Notion that I'm a big fan of um, is a really good way to stay organized and get what you need to do. And the most important thing with staying organized is you might read a book or a blog post and people give you this perfect system but the perfect system is the one that works for you, not what works for someone else. So my advice here, like anything, start small and find one thing and, and see what starts to work for you and keep testing and trying because over time, you're gonna notice a huge difference. And next, I wanna talk about um, saying no. This is one of the hardest words for CSMs to say. And I wanna paint no in a more positive light and share of why it can be helpful. So Steve Jobs attributed a lot of Apple's success because they said no to a lot of good ideas to just focus on the great ideas. And that's the thing with business. There's a lot of trade-offs that need to be made and you feel like you need to do it all, but it's not always possible. So the way that you can overcome that is to be very crystal clear on what is the most important thing you can do or things. I, I try and keep it that list as small as possible. Um, but it's important to have conversations within your organization to understand what those things are. Because if you're guessing, it's probably not a good space to be. And it's also not a good space for if you're a leader, your team should know what is more important. So it, this comes really to, to both ends of the spectrum, but this can be fixed by having clear conversations. And if you're wondering what that might look like, you want to be very clear on goals. So one re action I'd recommend is if you sit down with your manager, and if you're more of a strategic CSM dealing with a small, smaller but big book of business is have this conversation with your customers so you're perfectly aligned on what's most important because value for you might not always equal value for them. So you almost wanna know exactly what they mean so you can execute from there. And the first thing I would say is what are the company's biggest priorities for this year? And this will set the table for, you know maybe your company is trying to IPO in the year. So net retention is super important and that you can take that goal and then go back and figure out how it can affect your day. Then the next thing I would ask, whether it be my manager or the customer I'm working with, is understand their goals for this year. The more you can make the people you work with look better, that's only going to benefit you down the long road, makes you a lot more effective and stand out as an employee. And then the last thing I would say is What's the most important thing I can do to add value to our company? And if it's your customer, say your company. And just these three questions are gonna unlock a lot of answers that are gonna be very helpful for you and know what to do. So we'd love to do a quick exercise. If you have a pen and paper, bring it out um, or you can do it on your computer. But I, I personally think pen and paper is probably the best way to do this. Um, but the Eisenhower matrix, if you've never heard of it, is a very good way to handle your to-do list. So I think the most important thing we can understand as we have these very long to-do lists, it feels like we can never get anything done, is make the distinction that no, not all of our tasks are created equally. Some things are wildly important, other things can wait, and others might not be worth our time anymore. So we'll give you a, a minute if you just wanna write down a few things that fall into each of these quadrants. So all you need to do is just take a, you know, pen and paper and just draw a line up the middle and then a line across the other side and then put it into these quadrants. So is it not important, important, urgent or non-urgent? And it clearly works like that. So um, we'll give it a minute. So um, I'd like you to just write these things out and observe what, what happens here. Because this is a quick way to figure out if something is really worth your time or um, when to do it. And then while you're writing that out, I can just quickly describe. So obviously, urgent and important, that's due, so you wanna get that. That's, that should clearly let you know what needs to get done right away. And then the non-urgent but important is scheduling. That's clearly something that's very important. 
Um, and then not important, but it's urgent is delegate. Who can do it for you? And this is a thing where as an individual contributor or as a CSM, you might struggle with and say, well, no one can do my work for me. Um, I think it's important to remember that if you work in part of a larger team, sometimes other people within your team can help you. Or if maybe someone in your product team or engineering team can also assist you with things too, because what takes you an hour and a half might take someone else a minute or two. So I think that's an important part. And the other part that I get with people with the delete is saying, well, I have to do this stuff. I can't not do it. And I think it's important to remember that if you're doing something that adds zero value and you're confident about that is to have a discussion with your leaders and say, I'm sure you don't want me to waste time on things that don't matter either. Here's why I think this, I could spend better time. What do you think about us not doing this activity, cutting down on this activity? So that should be a fairly helpful thing. for So I'll give you guys a little bit more and then we can move on to the next part. Okay, so now that we've covered prioritization, let's talk about being proactive. And I want to talk about what this means and why it's so important. And this is a great quote, anticipate the difficult by managing the easy. And the whole idea of being proactive and the crux of this conversation is to make as many decisions as you can up front to make take that psychological burden away from you. So your day is as easy to follow as possible and you're not having to guess as you go along. And of course, I wouldn't be a guy from Boston if I didn't have a slide about Tom Brady, but um, if you have a problem with this, you can leave the webinar, it's not for you. Um, but the reason why I respect Tom Brady for you know a lot of different reasons, but one thing that's really stood out to me is as he's been very successful over the last few years, especially with TB12, is he talks a lot about having very deliberate routines and recovery. And I think that's an important thing for CSMs to do as well. If we have some barriers around how we work and processes, that's just gonna make it easier for us to perform at a more predictable, consistent level. And also on the recovery, you don't wanna be working yourself nonstop because after a while you see diminishing returns, you face things like burnout, and you're not gonna be as effective in your job, and then you keep trying to push, you feel worse, and it starts a really difficult cycle. So let's talk about one of the most practical things you can do to implement something like this in your life. And for work, it's called the startup and shutdown routine. This is taken from a book called Deep Work um, that I've changed a little bit for my own experience as a CSM. So the benefits of doing this are that you help with focus and life balance. Because all this is, is just having deliberate practice around how you want to start your day and how you want to end your day. And what that does is it helps you get more done. If you're not familiar with Parkinson's law, that means that work tends to expand to the amount of time for that work to be done. So if you have a clear line in the sand of ending your day at a certain time, you're more likely to get that work done than if you just said, well, I'll, I'll work when work is done. Next, I think it really builds good habits. If you're more disciplined and consistent, it's gonna just make life a lot easier and predictable and take, a, take more back control in your day. And then the other part that I really love about this is reward your work with activities. Um, and that's something where I think it's very important if you're having, you know, if you're working very hard, you should also enjoy your life. So at the end of your day, maybe adding something in like going on a workout, watching your favorite show, cooking a good dinner, Rewarding yourself for hard work is a good way for you to keep this routine and make the most of it. So I'll be sharing the slides after this so everyone access to these templates. But I actually wanna start with the shutdown routine first. And this is something so easy, you can do with it, you can start it today. So here's an example, and I've underlined the parts that you're gonna change for your own situation and variables. But let's say I will end my day at 5.30, and then you obviously pick whatever time you wanna end your day at typically. And then you give your reason why. So I can get in a workout and stay healthy. And then at 5.15, I will write out my top three for the morning, move non-actionable emails into my no action folder. And that's a, a preview of what's to come. So it, it just keeps getting better, people, believe me. Um, and then at 5.30, I will close my laptop, write down one thing I'm grateful for, 
go for a walk and get some air to decompress from the work day. So the important parts of this script are what time you're gonna end your day, why you're committing to this routine, how you're gonna end your day, what specific routine, and then what's the thing you're gonna do at the end of your day. All right, let's see what that looks up on the startup routine. So remember the top three things that we have. That's gonna be very important. That's my personal one and I highly recommend it. I think that is the best way to start your day for a lot of different reasons. But here's my particular startup routine. I will start my day at 8.30 with taking action on my top three for the day. And that's whatever action you wanna pick. And this is another rule and guideline that I put in, in my startup routine that's very important to me that has taken my productivity to just skyrocketing levels where I can get done in an hour, what used to take me several. Um, I will leave my phone in another room. I will not open email and stay off websites that distract me. I am absolutely terrible with distractions. So I have to have like a, lot, a very deliberate process that helps me focus and get things done quickly. Um, when I typically do this in the morning, I feel great and it's a good way to get started. And if the rest of the day goes to hell, I still have something to show for it. Um, and then once again, you're, you're adding in your why to this. So I'm doing this to stay productive and have a life outside of work. Okay, so um, a little bit of fast food trivia for people. Uh, Wendy's was the first one to introduce the value menu, not McDonald's, and it was in 1989. So um, you're welcome if that ever comes up in trivia in your life, you can say, uh, thank this webinar. Uh, but I thought one thing that was really interesting is if you think of why a company like McDonald's or Wendy's is so successful is the predictability. There's only a few things on the menu. It's pretty repeatable. You're not going to them and they're not figuring out what they're gonna make for that. It's a set amount of things that are available to you. So it's easy no matter who does it or where the restaurant is, everything's gonna be pretty similar, but there's something for everyone. And I wanna, the way that I've taken this and applied it to my accounts is something I've called the value menu. And this is something where it's a list of value add activities or content that I share with customers because all of us want to stay in mind and consistently touch our customers. That's something that we're usually asked to do, but when put into practice, it can be one of the hardest things to do. And the reason is that how often have you looked to reach out to a customer or made it a, a thing that you wanted to do, but then you sit there and say, well, I don't know what to send them. I don't know what to do. And then either you just give up on it or you do something completely different. This is a very good solution that is uh, very practical and easy to implement. So this can be a Confluence page, an Excel doc, or anything that's available. And all it is is just a list of things you can do. You can put tags in there. But the idea is it's going to be something where there's an, an investment up front, but it's going to be more of a time savings later. So you do this once and you scale. Um, I recommend if you're part of a larger team, like have everyone put their stuff together and you're going to find out what other people do and it's going to widen out your content and the things you can, so you're not saying the same things all the time. Um, and I think it should be a living doc. That's obviously um, probably not even worth putting a bullet in, but here we are. Um, okay. So on top of that, now that we have a way to reach our business, I want to emphasize why you want to proactively manage your book of business. And this is really the gold standard for a good CSM and a proactive CSM. Um, it's very important to understand, you know, a good reason why you should reach out to an account. So I think some of the benefits here are, you're gonna be more focused on your accounts. You're not gonna let things slip. You'll get more done. And I think it's a good habit to reach out to your customers, but it can be very difficult. So I wanna go through an exercise that can make this possible for you. So the first thing we wanna start out with is we'll put up another poll here. And I'm, I'm genuinely interested to see this, but um, this is going to dictate the next part of this exercise. So um, how many accounts are you managing? Um, I'm very interested to see where this ends up. And for the 250 plus people, my heart goes out to you. I have, I have been there before, unfortunately. Okay, we're at. Almost like a perfect distribution on this. Um, pretty interesting. So I lost the slide. Um, I can't tell the clear winner here. Um, okay, yeah. So 25 to 49 is, is the most popular. Uh, makes sense. Followed by one vote less at 90 to 89. Um, very interesting here. So I want you to remember that number because we're going to do a little bit of math now. 
which it's not, don't scare it, don't get too scared, it's not too bad. Um, so this is another, I call this the account outreach matrix. This is another tool that I came up when I had um, over, I think probably like 150 accounts to handle, which seems like something that's completely impossible. And in this particular scenario, it's more for how I would do it as a, an enterprise CSM with 10 accounts, but the math still works. So there's two variables you need here, and you can just write this down on your same piece of paper, is how many accounts do you have? So, and then you just wanna divide that by how often should I be in contact? So the best way to do this is by, um, if you wanna do weeks or business, if you wanna do weekly, you're dividing by five because they're five days in a week. If you're doing bi-weekly, divide by 10 or bi-weekly. Um, you're all smart people, I'm sure you can figure this out. And for, if you go into more monthly or quarterly, the number for monthly is 20 because there's 20 business days. And for quarterly, it would be 60 for uh, 60 business days in the quarter. So once you divide that, you have the number of how many accounts you should reach in a day. Then I would take that and put it into an Excel doc or a column list and then take whatever number of accounts you have. So in this example, we have 10 accounts divided by five days is two accounts per day. And then the next step is to set a recurring invite for that frequency. So in this example, I'm doing it once a week. So I'd pop open an invite and then put in which accounts I wanna reach out to. And then I have this for the afternoon every single day. So that way, instead of remembering which accounts to reach out to, swimming in a sea of tasks, you pop this into your account and it's only a few that you have to reach out to in that day. And that's something where naturally, if you're taking a week off, there's a little bit of catch up and stuff like there, but it's been a very efficient way for me combined with the value menu um, to reach out to my customers on a fairly regular and predictable basis. So I'm staying top of mind and they're finding value in it. And I don't have to think about it. I've made, I've removed as much of the guesswork as possible. So all I really have to do is open this up and um, think about what would be most helpful for people. Okay. And lastly, we wanna talk about managing distractions. And it doesn't matter if you're CSM or anything, like no matter what your career is, distractions are get, gonna get in the way of success. And how you manage that really makes a big difference on your goals and how you're gonna do in success. So this is a quote I wish I came up with myself, but distraction is a killer of dreams, visions, and goals. A bit dramatic, but I think it's, uh, it's very impactful. So I think one thing that forces us to be more reactive than anything else in the world is a living in email. And don't get me wrong, it's a necessary email, but I've read that we spend, and this was before the pandemic, 3.1 hours a day on email alone. So that's just about half, a little bit under half your day or a third of your day, depending on how much you're working. And one thing I've noticed is that I've been doing this, uh, these training sessions for over a year and a half, and I'll always ask people, do you start your day with email? And usually around 75 to 90% of the room raises their hand and they start their day with email. And this is another thing where um, I'm going to sound a little bit like so foxy here, but it's one of those things where I would highly recommend not doing that for several different reasons. And the first would be that if you start your day with email, you instantly surrender your control to the day. Um, as soon as you start, you're, it's not, no longer about what you want to get done. It's what other people are going to do. And the next thing is you set yourself up for, for distraction right away. So sometimes you might get an email from a client in Connecticut and you're thinking about your aunt that lives in Connecticut. And then sooner or later, you're looking at pictures of dogs. And I've, I've certainly gone down that rabbit hole myself. Um, and then lastly, it can actually impact your mental health. So there's actually a phenomenon known as lottery brain, where the reason that we pick up our phone is to get a um, reward from we want to get good news and all those alerts make us more susceptible to checking it out. So as we check our phone um, and we start the day hoping for good news and it's bad news, that makes us upset. So we start checking our email more often for better news and it leads to this really difficult cycle where that's how you find yourself checking your phone all the time. So the trick here is to put some, guard, uh, some guardrails up on email, which is fair boundaries that can be very impactful. And just like your calendar, you wanna use your email as a tool and not let it run your day and not let it run you. And I'd say just behind the calendar, this is another skill that can add a lot of time to your day and make you a lot more proactive if you can implement a few different changes. So I was actually working with someone um, that I was coaching and she was telling me how she gets over hundred emails a day. There's so much to do. 
And then we went through the, one of these exercises and then realized that there's only seven things that she had to respond to in a day. A lot of our emails are also not created equal. So having systems in place can be very helpful. So the first thing I, I love to do a live demo here, but we're you know, only so much time in the day, uh, but the no action folder. That's something where email is a very good store of record. And that's something where you want to add in what's really important. Um, so with no action folder, that's any email that you have that you want to keep reference, but you don't have anything to do with it. Um, and then I would automatically use filters and rules for any email that has unsubscribe in it, because that tends to be something that you don't have to respond to right away. So I would auto filter that into my no action folder. I would take any other common updates that I get, um, whether that be from a, a user portal or non-actionable emails. So you're not getting as much mess in your main inbox. And just that alone makes you feel like there's not quite as much to do. And so you won't get overwhelmed and run away or, or avoid your email altogether. Um, getting good at filtering or rules, depending on if you use Gmail or Outlook, is something that, once again, like anything else, upfront investment, but it's going to save you tons of time on the back end and make your life easier. Um, and then uh, the other thing with email is I would only check it at certain times. I know this isn't the most realistic thing. And I would say if you're just starting out, if you can even do that one hour a day without email, that's going to make a huge difference for you. So. The next thing I want to talk about is not only, um, you know, just with our devices like phones. Um, obviously, we have like social media and things like that. And then we have Slack and all these other things that are constantly pulling for our attention. This is another thing that sets you up to be reactive if you don't have any guardrails or control over it. So making some simple changes and using technology for your own good um, can make a big difference here. So one thing I found really fascinating because I've, I've studied this a lot is that if you've ever wondered why all your alerts are the color red, it's that the color red is ingrained in our psychology for us to find urgency. If you think of things like stoplights or fire hydrants, it is, our brain associates that with the sense of urgency and that we should act. And that's why they use the color red. And the same way that we've been you know, hardwired for that, and that's really the tip of the iceberg for how controlling these things can actually be. So one of the keys here is to take away some of the power from it. So um, I'm not sure if anyone has ever used Duolingo before, but this is one of my favorite uh, memes I've ever seen in my life. Uh, but one thing I would say, which sounds a little bit drastic and I'm happy to debate it with anyone and uh, talk further. Um, I have disabled notifications for about four years. And it's one of the best things that I've ever done um, because for several reasons, I still might check my things more often than I like to, but the whole idea is that I want to be in control of my day and not let my devices dictate where my focus goes. Um, I would say one of the benefits is it gives me more, more time in my day. We average at least 46 notifications a day just on our smartphones. So if you think of if each notification takes away from two minutes of you, that's an hour and a half of your day gone. Another thing, too, is that I feel like I get more done and I would you know, bet that data wise that would prove it as well. Um, you lose 80% of your productivity when you multitask. Uh, so this actually ensures if you don't have notifications that reduces your chance of multitasking. Um, and then I, knew, I think another thing that we are really struggling with, not in just customer success, I think this is a larger societal problem, is the feel to the need to always be on and be responsive and that we equate being responsive with being productive at work. And if I don't get back to someone, they're not going to think I'm a good worker. I think the conversation needs to change from being responsive to being valuable. And I think those one is way more important than the other, but we really prioritize the wrong thing. And it's leading to not only not as good of work product, but we're all being miserable by it. So I think some of the challenges there of that always on lifestyle, which I've definitely lived too, is you're not in control of your day. You compulsively check your devices and it makes it impossible to separate from work. And that's how we lead to things like burnout and not feeling in control. So you might wonder, how do I actually make this work? How do I make these changes? If you are bought in, if I have convinced you to see the light here, it all comes down to communication and putting things um, in the right way with your people. And so I would say, you wanna have conversations with your team, your customers and your management so they know that you might not be as responsive on certain things. And I would recommend, you know, I know that it's completely a pipe dream 
that you only check email once a day. I, I wish I could live in that world personally, but I know it's not realistic. I would say if you can even just take an hour in the morning where you're not on email and that half hour when you're sending out um, your value mail stuff, that's really going to, just that alone is going to make a huge difference for you. But if you can take it up from there, that will make a huge difference. So I would have conversations with anyone so they know why you're doing this. And it's not, hey, I don't want to check email because I don't like it. It's, hey, I want to set the expectation that I'm trying to add more value to our company or your company, and I won't be responsive from the hours of eight to 10. Here's my cell phone. You can call me if anything's an emergency. And that's exactly what I did. And I can count on one on less than one hand how many times anyone's ever given me a call because something truly couldn't wait till nine or 9.30. Uh, I know that's, you know, it sounds like a, a crazy thing, but um, it also gives you a bit of a reality check of, you know, how life goes on without you sometimes. Um, and then I'd advocate, like, just to hit my point earlier, like, if you can just start with that hour of not being on email or systems like that and just focusing on work, it's going to make a huge difference for you. And I know one of the biggest challenges that people have is thinking, well, I can't miss anything. People aren't going to think I'm working or what if something bad happens. If you're on an important call with a customer for an hour, you can't take another call during that. You shouldn't be answering email. And the same should apply. You should put that same focus on things that are important. for you. All right. So we've covered a lot of stuff today and I want to put it all together. And now you can take this playbook and hopefully it makes a big difference for you. It's, it's pretty simple. But um, at the end of your day, you can write out your top three things that you want to do, have your shutdown routine and go enjoy the rest of your night. Um, and then at the start of your day is to attack your top one to three. So instead of starting the day with email, you actually start with a quick win. You might be in a better mood. You have something to show for it. And you start actually working toward your goals. And then it might, it might feel a little bit off at first, but you'll notice huge impacts down the line. And then in the afternoon, do your account outreach for 30 minutes with your value menu. Um, sometimes it might have to be a little shorter, longer, but find something that works for you. And that goes back to my earlier point. Um, this is a suggestion. Hopefully it works for you. Maybe you can make it fit into yours, but same thing. It's just making sure that you've designed time to make this work for you. And pro tips from the easily distracted, because that is certainly the camp that I fall into. Um, keep your phone in another room during this time. Use an app to block distracting websites. I'm a big fan of Freedom if uh, anyone is looking for a recommendation. I use that all the time. That's been very helpful for me. Um, check your email at set times and get rid of your notifications. So let's end on a uh, final exercise. And believe it or not, anytime I have these conversations, it's not about, you know, people believe that it's a good thing to do, but they might, there's, a lot of the objections lie in some of the psychology behind it um, and what's going to happen and what if. And I want you to think instead of what can go wrong or what can go right if you do this. So I want you to think through these three questions for the next minute or so. What would I accomplish with an extra hour a week? Because if you're focused, you can add a lot more. And that can, I've found I'm probably gaining back probably several hours a week just by following these things just by making a small change. And now I want you to think, and especially if you still have your piece of paper, like write that down really quick. And the next one would be, what, what's one small change I can implement first? I know that you're not gonna be able to completely start this brand new, um, but you'll have all these slides just for attending today and you can follow everything through and slowly work up there and get it. So pick one thing that you found really helpful and try start to start doing that and commit to yourself because the, the results will come with the action. And then what beliefs are holding me back and how might they be incorrect? I know a big one for me was the, what if something happens, people are gonna need me, they're not gonna think I'm valuable. And by reframing it to make sure that I'm doing things to add value, it's really changed the conversation where I've been more of an asset to my company and my customers by focusing on the right things as opposed to just being that person that emails right back. So I'll give another couple of, uh, I'll give another like 30 seconds, I'll grab some water, um, and then we'll move on to the, the final thoughts. And we're gonna have a good amount of time for Q&A, which is great. So I've seen a ton of them come in, so very excited to cover all that. Okay. Final thoughts. These are the three takeaways I want you to have from today. Um, I'm available if you need me, but focus on 
doing the right things instead of just doing more. That's number one. Number two is make it easy on yourself by building a process and making that as simple as you can. Easier it is to follow, easier it is to execute. And then last, if you can only pick one, you want to be known as someone who adds tremendous value instead of someone who responds fast. So that is my time. Uh, we can do some questions, but hope you found this helpful. We'd love to hear, always looking to hear feedback, how I can get better, what parts you liked, what parts you'd like to hear more about. Um, stay in touch with me. I got my LinkedIn here, um, have a website. You can reach out to me directly, but um, thank you TrendZero for having me and thank you for taking the time today. Really appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks, Ryan. I, I know I'm not a CSM and I took plenty of notes for things that I can do to uh, make my days go better um, and not get overwhelmed. Um, so thank you for all of those very practical tips that we can implement. Um, as Ryan said, please go ahead and submit your questions. We have a ton that have already come in, so we will get to as many as we can. Um, that will take us to the end of this hour. Um, so our first question is, I love the idea of dedicating 20% of your day to strategic projects uh, for 80%. What is a healthy split between email catch up versus meetings versus working on actions coming in from those meetings? Yeah, that's an interesting one. So I would just from the playbook that I gave earlier, that's eight, if you take the hour in the morning and the 30 minutes in the afternoon, that's 18% of an eight hour workday. Um, so I think that the more you try and engineer how much time you're working on each thing, uh, that can make it a little bit more challenging. So, um, you know, some days, especially in a CSM role, you're going to have days that are super, super busy. There's a lot of things going on. Maybe it's the end of quarter or you have a lot of new customers coming on. Um, it, it's tough to give you a perfect breakdown, but I would always focus on, um, you know, what's going to be the most helpful for, for yourself down the, the road. Awesome. Yeah, I think, I think that makes sense. I mean, of course, things are going to change a little bit there, mm -hmm. but good rule of thumb. Um, let's see. Our next message um, says, hey, Ryan, I can't wrap my head around something that would be urgent, but unimportant. Could you give some examples there? So in your matrix, uh, the bottom yeah. left-hand corner. I'm trying to think of what might make the most sense there. Um, and that's the delegate part. Um, yeah, so something for that would be like, if you have to fill out a form to like, you know, like you're um, like, I need to book a hotel for this room. Like, it's not the most, like, that's something where like, I need to do that, but it's not gonna like make my life super important. So like, that's something where I might delegate it to like um, someone on my team to like help me out with. So I think that's the delegate function. So that's that's the first thing that comes to mind to be honest. Cool. Um, let's see. Our next question says, what are your thoughts on automating proactive outreach? I think it's a, a good thing to do, uh, especially if you're a CSM that's in, I'd say if you have like a larger book of business, uh, that that's really the, the main thing that you can do. I've done that with um, tools like sales after outreach before. Um, on the important caveat that make sure your outreach is good and it's relevant. Um, so whether it be, you can build it, some of the things I've done is like building it out per persona or things that people have talked about or company wide. Um, because if, you know, all that, you know, those tools are very powerful, but if the messaging and the content isn't good, then you're just, it's, you know, you're optimizing for, you know, sending a bunch of crap. So I just make sure like, as long as the messaging is good, I think those tools uh, play in a very important role. I like that. Um, our next question is, can you share some general ideas for what would be on your value menu? I realize this will be specific to the company, but just trying to brainstorm. Yep. Um, having them attend a roadmap session, having them um, do like some type of maturity assessment, holding um, like doing a, a one to many webinar, having them join like a product call. Um, sending them blog posts on things that are interesting. Also, uh, if you are a CSM that handles, like say your financial services or retail, I'd also subscribe to magazines or um, newsletters that are gonna have good content for that. And I think as a CSM, some of the best things you can send 
are other industry publications that aren't about your company. That's a way that you can stay top of mind and add value to the conversation um, without, you know, just like pitching stuff. So like when I, I think that's another important, like that we could go way down a rabbit hole with that. But a lot of my outreach, I try and make sure that it's more about them and less about my company. Um, because, you know, at the end of the day, like every software company is a means to an end. Um, obviously, we all make great software, but I think it's the partnership. And where you stand out as a good CSM is being that partner that knows the industry, knows the problem, and knows how you can get value from the solution um, is going to be most important. Excellent. I like those engagement ideas. Um, so we have another question. I think I know your answer on this. Um, but do you also recommend avoiding Slack and other internal messaging systems at the beginning of your day? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's the same. Like I count that in with email too. Um, that's what I'm, I'm even more clear about with my teammates. Um, obviously, like in my accounts, I have several people that I'll work with um, or like leaders and stuff like that. I've been doing that for years as well, where I'll say like, hey, if, if something's important, call me or email me. Um, and that has really worked out fine. So I'll still check it in a fairly regular regular interval, um, but I, I don't always have it on. And just like even that sound of it um, bothers me, so. Yeah, I'm very curmudgeon about that. <laughs> um, we have a question here that says, as a manager of the customer success team, what is the number one thing to keep my CSMs from burning out? Um, I would say going back to where we talked about priorities, um, that's a thing where I looked, I didn't mention, and I, for, I meant to make a mention of this in the presentation, but I looked at a job description for a CSM and there were 25 responsibilities on it. And I think that CS is a stopgap. If it's not really clearly defined, it can be a naturally an overwhelming spot. And I think that's, it mainly falls on the CSM. Um, if you're a manager, it's not always easy to change everything around you, but um, is to really be clear on like what the most important thing is. If you're sending, and I always try to be cognizant of that when I was a manager, it's like, trying to only ask for like one big thing a week um, or like focus on one project or initiative a quarter um, instead of doing four things that we're going to forget or not going to execute on. And then we all feel miserable. So like if you narrow the scope of what's most important, um, that's going to make your team happier. They're going to get more, they're going to get the right things done. So, um, and that might take a conversation for you to sit down with your, uh, your VP or CEO or whatnot and, and be very clear about that. I like that. I think role clarity is a very important piece there. Yeah. Um, our next question is, what are your thoughts on deciding on the cadence of proactive outreach for CSMs in SaaS? Um, yeah, so I think it's, I would base it off of like how often you need to be talking to your customers. Uh, I, I don't think it makes a difference between SaaS or a a, you know, on-premise solution. Um, I would decide like what other people in your industry are doing, what other people in your company do and what makes the most sense to you. Because um, I think it's also like, you don't want to, I think an important thing that a lot of CSMs need to understand is having empathy for your customers that they might have a tech stack of 20 different tools. So they have 20 different CSMs. So I, I might even go out on a limb here and say less is more sometimes. Um, so that's another thing where like quality over quantity is very important. So, um, you know, build that value menu to have like really good impactful things on it for them. I like that. Um, let's see. This question says, how do you keep your days from getting derailed when you have multiple customers that have complex issues with lots of follow-up in the week? Feels like that constantly derails any systems that I've put into place. Yep. Um, that's another thing where I don't want to say it's like, it's a company problem. Um, but if you introduce yourself and like, this is kind of a hot take, but like if you introduce yourself to your customer and, or someone introduces you as your, as the CSM and they introduce it as like white glove support, or you're the person to come to when issues happen. Um, I, in my view of CS, I don't think that's where we should be spending too much of our time. Uh, I know, especially if you're at a smaller company, like that's a reality. Or even if you're at a bigger company, like your biggest account goes down, like you need to do whatever the hell you need to do to fix it. Um, but I think it's very important where 
instead of trying to fix something that you can't control is to be very proactive about communicating with it, but not wasting, you know, hours and hours of time on fixing something that you can't really do anything about. Uh, I don't know if, I, I know every CS department is different. Some people actually handle the issues and things like that, but um, I think that's a company thing of like having a clear separation between CS and support uh, will make life easy. And that's another thing where like, I've been very fortunate where most organizations I've worked with has had a very strong support team, which will make life as a CSM a lot easier. So I, I feel your pain there. I've been there itself. So, um, wish I had a better answer. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, there's so many questions. Uh, let's see. Do you have any parameters that define an SLA for CSMs? Um, no, okay. I don't, I don't really know what to do with that one, to be honest. Oh, good. Let's see. Um, sorry, I'm just scrolling through a bunch, trying to find one that we haven't already touched on a little bit. Oh, I, I see one that's really okay. good. Um, this is how can a CSM stop feeling guilty slash miserable mm. for not completing their daily tasks and goals? That is something where I lived that and it made me like, I, I feel this in my soul. So I'm glad someone said this. Um, and I struggle with it too. And it's something, I don't know if anyone on here is a Seinfeld fan. Um, but there's one episode where Jerry asked Newman, who's a, a postal worker, why so many postal workers go insane. And he said, because the mail just keeps coming. Um, and I think that's the same with CS and knowing that like our work is never done. So we set out to have this amazing day where we complete everything and we're chasing a goal that's not there. So that inherently makes you a lot more miserable. So it's a really difficult cycle that I found myself into. And I think the first step is noticing that um, it's okay to do your best and none of us are perfect. And I don't think you're going to be able to get everything done in a day. And the, the good thing is, if you have more work to do, that means you still have a job. So like, try and think of it that way. I know it's not the perfect answer, but um, definitely take it a little bit easy on yourself because you know there there is always more work that can be done. Um, and I would just switch to focusing on what's most. Important. I like that. Um, we have a question here. We talked about how a, a manager can help manage employee burnout, but there's a, a question here that's slightly different on um, any tips on how managers can spot employee burnout on their team. Yeah, that's um, that's a really complicated topic. Um, I've I've been in that scenario before, um, a little on on both sides of it. Um, and I would say there's everyone handles things differently. So that inherently makes it a lot more challenging. It's obviously a very um, a hot button issue that faces a lot of people. It has very disastrous consequences. Um, but I think it, it can come down to just observing someone to see if like either some people will get a lot more quiet, other people will get more, a lot more hasty. So I would say instead of looking for a certain behavior, maybe look for a change in behavior might be the first place that I'd look. Mm -hmm. But my favorite thing to do there um, is if you're having a conversation with someone, say, hey, how are you doing? And then they say, fine. And then just like you're in a discovery call or something like, well, how are you really doing? How are you, like, And just trying to get them open up. And um, maybe they might tell you, like, but they don't, they obviously don't have to. Um, but it's a very easy line to tell. So um, I totally feel the challenge there. So I would just make it a point to let people know, like, you can even lead with your own experience if, if you've ever been there or, hey, I'm having a hard time and I want you to know that like this isn't always the easy job, but I'm here to support you for whatever you need. That might be better than, you know, asking someone outright because that's probably not the best thing to do either. So, yeah. yeah. You have some good advice. Um, let's see. <clears throat> let's, we have a question that says, how do you set boundaries when it feels like other departments view CSMs as people who you would delegate work to? Uh, because we are customer facing, most departments push their work on us and we're unable to say no or delegate to other coworkers. Yep, that also goes to, uh, I think that's a, a company dynamic thing too. 
Um, but I've, I've definitely been in there before. And I would think of, you know, I, I would personally have a, a conversation with like a leader of that team or the leader of my team to, to let them know that like, Hey, we're happy to help here. And I, I've even been in that scenario of like, as a, a leader and said, we're, my team's happy to help, but you have to understand that we have X, Y, and Z priorities. So it, you know, the earliest we're going to be able to do it is X, Y, and Z, because, um, like I said earlier, like, um, saying no is a very healthy thing to do. And I think if you explain the rationale why of why you might not have the bandwidth or if there's something very important, that's better than just saying like, we're not gonna do it. So it, it comes down to communication like a lot of things. Yeah, I like that. Um, so we have a question that says, could you expound on how to start a conversation with customers or how to communicate not being available during certain times of day? Uh, to communicate with a customer? Yeah, to say that you won't be available during portions of a day. Um, yeah, I would like maybe have that conversation. It depends like if that's, um, you know, if they have some sort of release, maybe you have to change your, if there's like something very impactful that like only you can fix, maybe it's a different story, but I, I don't see why it would be more of a conversation than like, hey, I'm available at this time or I have another meeting or there's something going on. So. I, I like, I've heard the, the phrase like no is a complete sentence. So I think like, if you can confidently explain, going back to the other thing, like you can confidently explain like, hey, I have X amount of more customers, you know, I'm, I'm gonna do everything I can to take care of you. But um, I, unfortunately I'm not available at that time. Yeah, make that sense. Uh, let's see. Let's see if we can get maybe one more question in here. We've gone through so many, so I'm trying to find. Um. I got one that I would like to do. Yeah, go um, for it. How to ask for help when you're feeling burnt out. I'm afraid I can come across as lazy or I don't want to do a certain task. Um, mm -hmm. That's that's another like common thing that I've felt before. Um, I think asking for help is, it, it's a personality thing. I struggled with it really bad. Um, but I think it's very important to like, if you add in the communication of like why you're asking for help or why you're feeling burnt out, I will guarantee you your leader would rather know now than when before you left the, than after you like you handed in your notice um, because it should be in their interest to make sure that you're like in a good spot you're feeling like you can add a lot of value um, I would ask like if you there's someone on your team that seems like they can handle things effortlessly like sit with them for a day and understand what they do um, or there's someone else that like um, you really model or you think is like very helpful, like try and find out how they attack their day too. So not only can you ask your manager, but like try and understand from your peers, like what are things that works? What are things that don't? Um, and then if you're like completely overwhelmed, like sometimes you have to have those hard conversations of like, okay, these are the amount of hours I have in a week. These are what's being asked for me. We need to figure out like what's realistic here, which like that's a very difficult conversation, but it, you know, it's temporary discomfort as opposed to the permanent discomfort of just being like completely shelled with absurd amounts of work that you can never completely do and feeling miserable. Yeah, that was a good last question to end on. Um, thank you so much, Ryan, uh, for sharing all of this advice. Um, and I wanna remind everyone that we were recording today's session and we will be sending that out in an email tomorrow with a link to the recording that you can watch on demand and also a PDF of the slides, um, as I saw many of you were asking for. So hopefully you can review those, share them with your team. Um, and at the end of this webcast, uh, you'll see a survey pop up. We'd appreciate it if you could just take a minute before logging off to complete that survey to provide your feedback um, for both Brian and I and our webinar. And thanks again for joining us. And I hope everyone has a great rest of their day. Thanks, everyone. Bye.